comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. Good evening, I'm JC Navarrete, and this is ABC7 Extra Sunday Edition. El Paso's growth is slowing down, and we may no longer be the sixth largest city in Texas. The online news publication El Paso Matters dove into the census numbers and discovered El Paso's population is 865,657. That's a growth of only 8%, marking the county's slowest period of growth since the Great Depression. This slow growth could have an impact on all El Pasoans from the number of state representatives we sent to Austin, to the political clout at the federal level, to the allocation of funds for important programs. District maps will likely be redrawn given the new census numbers right now. El Paso has five state representatives. Redistricting could prompt the loss of one state representative or at least having that person also represent part of Hudspeth County. So what happened to El Paso and its growth? Which areas of town are stagnant and which are expanding? More importantly, are El Pasoans leaving and why? That's what we want to talk about tonight. Joining us to talk about this very important issue at hand that affects us all is the founder and CEO of El Paso Matters, Bob Moore. Also joining us is former state representative Joe Pickett. Mr. Pickett is no stranger to redistricting and was even on the redistricting committee 10 years ago. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. I would like to get started here with Bob. Bob, you analyzed the data in the Census Bureau release this month. Give us a quick summary here of what you found and were you surprised by this data? Uh, the, the one surprise, I think, is probably that the county population came in a little bit higher than what the estimates had shown. The general estimates were about 840,000. We wound up at 865,000. But uh, so that meant that countywide we grew uh, by about 8%, which is slightly above the, the national average, but it's far below the growth rates we've seen uh, in the, the previous decades. And most importantly, it's a far slower growth rate than Texas as a whole, and that's where these redistricting challenges that Joe can really speak to are going to come in. The uh, other real surprise, I think, is the fact that the population within the city of El Paso only grew by about 4%, and if you look at the census estimates over recent years, it, it appears that the population within the city of El Paso has been declining for the last three or four years. And that's exactly what we want to talk about right now. Joe, you took part in redistricting maps after a previous census report. What sort of impact can these findings have on representation at the state and federal level? Well, I guess, uh, first off, unfortunately, I've been a part of three redistrictings. One of those wasn't even taken up by the legislature, which the general public isn't really aware of the process could be outside of even their elected officials. In 2001, the House was controlled by the Democrats, but the Republicans controlled the Senate. So the Senate didn't pass a redistricting bill in 2001, so it was left up to a legislative redistricting committee, which is made up of five statewide elected officials, including the Speaker, and four of those five were Republicans. So they drew it, five people who didn't hold public hearings. So in 2001, 2002 election, the Republicans took over the House of Representatives, and that was a historic year because that's when Tom DeLay came down from Washington and we redistricted again. Instead of waiting 10 years, we did it immediately the next session, and it's been history since. Then we did it again in 2011, uh, challenged in court. In fact, we get challenged uh, just about every time there is a redistricting effort in Texas, so this won't be any different after the, the next session. And the governor doesn't have to do it in a special session. I know it's been talked about. Uh, people are saying that we got to get everybody there to show up so they can vote, but it may not even happen in this next legislative session at all. JC. Yeah, then that's, you know, that's the that's the concerning thing. Who knows what comes next? Your time will only tell. But Bob, did your research show where El Paso is just not growing and where it did grow somewhat? I mean, the 8% that you talk about, what does that really show us? Uh, I think the real sh uh, shorthand of this is that areas outside the city grew pretty rapidly. Areas within the city uh, didn't. Uh, and so you saw uh, Horizon City, for example, grow by more than 30%. Uh, uh, Socorro also showed some growth rates. Some of the unincorporated areas did as well. Uh, uh, so as we look at the movement of political power uh, uh, in El Paso, 
uh, it's really shifting westward. Uh, uh, so it's not just the legislature and Congress that have to be redistricted. Uh, city council and county commissioner's court seats and then school board seats will have to be redistricted. So the balance of power in this town uh, is, is tilting toward where Joe lives. Uh, the further east you go in town, the more clout uh, that you have. Uh, Joe used to live in the middle of nowhere, and now he's in the middle of everything. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're seeing. We are seeing El Paso expand, but again, it's not really an equal expansion when you see the far east side of town growing at a faster rate than some other parts of town. Now, Bob, you did create some very helpful charts for your story. Let's take a look at the El Paso population change in the city here in the county. Take a look at your screen. This shows the slight change in population between 2010 and 2020. Is this what shows uh, that 8% that increase here just by this uh, map right here that, that you've created, these, these bar graphs that you've created? What does yeah. this show us? Yeah, so the difference between the, the yellow and the blue bar in the county is is 8%, but the difference between the yellow and the blue bar when you look at the city uh, data off to the left is only about 4%. Uh, um, so that uh, kind of shows you the pace of growth. And, and just by uh, means of comparison, uh, over recent censuses, El Paso was growing by 15, 20%. So when Joe was serving on redistricting committees, he had some clout to be, be able to bring to the table because El Paso's population was growing at least as fast as the rest of Texas, uh, uh, although our political affiliation wasn't quite shifting with the rest of Texas. So that put Joe in a real challenging spot. And I quickly want to show this next graph here because it shows the change by decade. Take a look. It does look like we did top off in the years after World War II. Then it pretty much goes downhill. Are there any studies that tell us why the population growth started slowing down? Well, a, a part of it is just, you know, the, you run out of space after a while. And so there's no way you can forever continue the 60% growth rate that we saw in one decade. So you expect some kind of natural slowing uh, a lot of El Paso's growth ties to what's happening in immigration, um, uh, and, and increasingly a lot of it ties to the wage structure in town, I believe. Uh, 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 the average wage in El Paso is only about two-thirds of the uh, uh, national average wage, so that, that creates some, some challenges, and I think that's one of the reasons we've seen this slowing. Um, and it's, it's worth noting, too, that growth in and of itself is not good or bad. Um, it depends on, on, on what you do with that. Uh, so I want to make sure it doesn't sound like I'm a champion of unbridled growth. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, certainly in the context of what we're talking here with political influence and things like that, this slower growth rate compared to the rest of the state is going to have significant consequences for El Paso in the coming years. Well, we do have still a lot to unpack here, so don't go anywhere. When we come back, I'll ask my guests what this slowed population growth could mean for school districts. You won't want to miss that. You're watching ABC 7 Extra, where news comes first. You've got enough to think about maintaining. Good thing the all-new 2022 Volkswagen Taos has a lower cost of maintenance than Toyota RAV4. Come into your Volkswagen dealer today and lease the all-new 2022 Taos S for just $229 a month. Unlock a summer of possibilities in a new Chevy. Expand your options and your perspective. Find your next adventure in a new Chevy. Make no monthly payments for 120 days on all Silverado 1500 Crew Cab pickups. Plus, get 2.49% financing for 72 months and get 3750 total value on this Silverado Texas Edition. Trade-in value is heating up right now. Come see us and trade up at Casa Buick GMC. It's the summer of big value, and your old ride is your ticket to a hot new Buick or GMC. Get $2,500 off MSRP on a GMC Sierra 1500. Trade-in value is scorching hot, but it will cool down. Bring us your car and get paid today. Get more for your trade-in at Casa Buick GMC. Home of the nice guys. Yeah! With a Honda in your garage, every summer adventure leads to another. Get an incredible summer offer on a new Honda, only at the Honda Summer Sales Event. Ready, set, go. You've got enough to think about maintaining. Good thing the all-new 2022 Volkswagen Taos has a lower cost of maintenance than Toyota RAV4. 
Come into your Volkswagen dealer today and lease the all-new 2022 Taos S for just $229 a month. Welcome back to ABC7 Extra Sunday Edition. I also want to welcome back the founder and CEO of the online publication El Paso Matters, Bob Moore. El Paso Matters cited the slowed population growth. Also, welcome back to former state representative Joe Pickett. Uh, Joe, here, let's get started here because you are no stranger here to redistricting. Let's talk about congressional redistricting with what we could be seeing going forward. You know, that's another thing that a lot of your viewers may not realize. Congress doesn't draw their own lines. They're drawn by the legislature. If the legislature doesn't do it, which has been the case in Texas in the past, it's done by the courts. We've heard that Texas overall, though, is growing in population. Texas is gonna pick up two more congressional seats. We're gonna go from 36 to 38. And because the majority of Texas right now is Republican, and the gerrymandering that, gerrymandering that goes on during redistricting, it's more than likely that those two new seats will be Republican, which is going to have a lot to do with our representation, not just on the state level, but on the congressional level. School districts, transportation, health dollars, a lot of those are distributed by population. And even though maybe the state of Texas is growing overall, in fact, it's like double, it's about 16%. Because of that being different in El Paso, it could affect those school districts. But I'm really concerned about the congressional representation after this next redistricting, even more so than locally. And you touched a little bit on those school districts. Would we be seeing fewer dollars in services based on these numbers? And how far down the line do census numbers go when they're released here? Do, do they start affecting these school districts? Do they start feeling the pinch? It does on both levels. It does on the federal and the state level because on the state side, the legislature with all the different very, very complicated funding formulas for public education. Even though we've, over the past several decades, they wind up in lawsuits as well after appropriations and funding. We're gonna start with just raw numbers. And you're gonna have the same dollars because there's gonna be a move by those in control to leave the revenues the same. So if you leave the revenues the same, but you've got school districts in other parts of Texas with more students than El Paso has, and you divide it per student, we could end up with a lot less money from the state. It's the same identical type of process on the federal level as well. And if we don't have federal representation, we can't make up the difference. So it's extremely important, the congressional seats as well, JC. Now, Bob, you did, uh, you know, crunch the numbers here. You looked at the data uh, about some of the areas that saw little to no growth. What school districts experienced little to no growth? The, the census data itself isn't broken down by school districts, but I can tell you looking at enrollment data from the Texas Education Agency, El Paso school enrollment has been declining for eight years. Uh, and it's, it's especially pronounced at the K through two level where our enrollment is down about 15% uh, over that time uh, uh, and there's uh, you, the pandemic complicates things a lot so I want to just look at what was happening before the pandemic but before the pandemic El Paso County in 2019 only had one school district Canutillo that showed a growing student population the rest of them were declining and that decline is very pronounced in El Paso and Isleta school districts the two historic kind of core city districts we have um, so we've, we've been seeing this declining um, uh, uh, enrollment that's driven by a lot of factors. Uh, one is just uh, 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 declining fertility rates, uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, families are having a little bit fewer children. But uh, the other big driver is we are exporting young families from this community um, uh, because they can't afford to live here or can live uh, somewhere else better. And so that's really heavily impacted our schools. And I don't think we've talked enough about that as a community over what those long-term impacts of that are going to be. Now, speaking of long-term impacts, I do want to ask Joe here, EPIZ, YSZ, and SISZ have projects underway that are long-term here that they've been budgeted for. Does this mean that they may have to scale back in some projects in preparation for fewer dollars? Well, this argument or this situation is going to be the city, the county, and the school districts. If they're under construction, no, they're not gonna stop them. But what's gonna happen is you and I, as taxpayers, will pick up the difference. Um, I, th I believe over the next two or three years, if we're not careful, we already heard how high our taxes are now in the state of Texas. Uh, with this situation looming on the horizon, 
it could really push that number even higher than what Bob reported on, and our growth could actually become stagnant. There's parts of uh, Texas that are already that way, where the cities themselves, the tax rates are so high that they've driven out the families with children to the peripheral areas, and that's gonna happen in El Paso. Uh, what'll happen here is we'll have people moving to New Mexico, which could be a boon for them and a loss uh, for us. So um, it's gonna take a sharper pencil by uh, everybody, obviously, and the voters are gonna have to start making their their opinions known about the situation. On, on the New Mexico issue, the one thing I want to say is New Mexico has its own challenges, uh, and uh, the IRS does a real good job of tracking how people move. And over the last seven or eight years, for every one person who's moved from New Mexico to here, we've sent one back the other way. Um, uh, so it becomes qu quite a challenge. I think the more immediate impact that Joe's talking about now is going to be people, uh, instead of buying a home within the city limits of El Paso, are going to go out to the Clint ISD and some of those areas right outside the city limits where you don't have to pay any city uh, taxes. And most people, as you know, pay their property taxes through their mortgage. And by building your house, you know, a $150,000 house right outside the city limits, uh, you could save $100 or $200 a month on your mortgage. So that's the kind of real pressure that uh, these tax rates are putting on us. And that's that's a that's a low number. I mean, you, the, your city taxes are approximately 25% of your, your bill, so Bob's exactly right. What's different about El Paso and the rest of the state, and we don't have all the numbers yet because they're just barely putting this all together. We're going to find out where the migration is. We're going to find out what the ages are. But Texas is importing more people than we grow. There's more people coming in from other states like California to Texas than there are actual births in our state because we are so big and we are so diverse. There are areas that people want to flock to for whatever particular reason. So El Paso is uh, completely unique. It's all by itself. We need to come up with some solutions that are specific to our region because we can't always expect to have anybody um, east of I-35 even understand our situation like in Houston or Harris County, which is horrendous. That The place is growing uh, leaps and bounds. Absolutely. Well, you're watching ABC 7 Extra. Still ahead, I'll ask my guess if the slow population growth also means people are leaving the Sun City. You won't want to miss that. We'll be right back. The Olympic Games are on, and Toyota has great deals on Camry, Highlander, RAV4, and more. During the national sales event, get $750 customer cash on a new 2021 Camry. But it all ends September 7th. Toyota, let's go places. Grass looks great, Zeus. Hey, could you maybe trim the hydrangea too? Sure thing, Kevin. You want me to do the box suits as well? No. Finding the right person for the job isn't always easy. But when you have an insurance question, you can always count on your local GEICO agent. They can give you personalized advice and could help you save hundreds. Hey, Medusa, let's boogie. For expert help with all your insurance needs, get to know your local GEICO agent today. Hey, hello, hello. Unlock a summer of possibilities in a new Chevy. Expand your options and your perspective. Find your next adventure in a new Chevy. Make no monthly payments for 120 days on all Silverado 1500 Crew Cab pickups. Plus, get 2.49% financing for 72 months and get 3750 total value on this Silverado Texas Edition. At LongJohnSilvers.com, you can order online and sail past the line. Oh, and C prize. Get $5 off with promo code 8FAMILY5 when you order online at LongJohnSilvers.com. Long John Silvers. Once a year, we clear out millions of dollars of great inventory and make it go away. We take a beating. Four-piece bedroom, $11.99. Every item, 35 to 65% off. Miss it, and you'll have to wait another year. New Deal Furniture's annual in-store Labor Day warehouse sale. The Olympic Games are on, and Toyota has great deals on Camry, Highlander, RAV4, and more. Right now, get $750 customer cash on an adventurous new 2021 RAV4. But it all ends September 7th. Toyota, let's go places. Welcome back to ABC7 Extra Sunday Edition. Also, welcome back to the founder and CEO of online publication, El Paso Matters, Bob Moore, as well as former state representative, 
Joe Pickett. Now, Bob, I do want to bring up a graphic of wages, which you did use in your article. If you'll uh, take a look at your screen here, tell me what uh, this graphic indicates right here when you see it. Uh, if you're a skier, it's a really great <laughs> graphic because it's lots of thrill rides ahead. Uh, if you're somebody working in El Paso, it's really depressing. Uh, uh, this graphic shows that El Paso's average weekly wage is a percentage of the national average over the last two decades. And you can see right in the middle there, we had a bit of a spike where we went back up a little bit. That's basically when Fort Bliss was expanding uh, and that brought in more soldiers that were making a little bit more money than the average wage then. But since then, we've been on this decline. And so now we're at this level where uh, our average weekly wage is only about two thirds of the national and state average. And if you look only at private sector wages, the picture is even more bleak. Uh, the last I looked, the average private sector wage in El Paso was about 58% of the state and national average. So this really creates a lot of pressure on people to leave even if they may not want to. Uh, El Paso is a very family oriented town. People love to stay close to their families. Uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, but th this kind of economic reality forces a lot of people out. And we, you know, we use the phrase brain drain. That's not a phrase I like to use because it makes it sound like this is just ho college graduates that this is affecting. This is every level of uh, uh, occupation in El Paso, particularly uh, people with really good technical skills. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're drawn out of here to places like the Permian Basin in San Antonio. So this is a really, really worrisome trend that, again, I don't think gets enough conversation among policymakers. Yeah, it, it, to that point, Joe, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. Is El Paso seeing brain drain in your opinion? I, I'm like Bob. I don't like the term brain drain. I've got four kids. Three of them have chosen to stay here in El Paso, but two of them have had offers to go to other places. And so far, they're remaining here because, as Bob mentioned, family-oriented. They like the weather. They like uh, the, the culture here. But there's a point where it may be where they just have to make that decision because the property taxes are getting so high, the wages aren't going up, and they may leave. And it's a difficult problem. It's, it didn't start overnight. It's not going to be fixed overnight. But I think if we realize what's happening, I'm a small business person, and I'm having to make the decision whether I invest any more in El Paso because it's... It's just jaw-dropping uh, as to what you have to go through, the steps that a new business being created in El Paso. You know, we're not like Amazon. Uh, I'm glad Amazon is coming. Uh, Amazon may force um, some of the other employers here to pay a higher wage, but then again, we're pushing them to the point where do they have 10 people at a certain uh, wage rate or reduce that to eight and pay them a little bit more? So you didn't do anything. You put two people up for possible uh, migration to somewhere else, even though eight get a little bit higher. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's going to be a, a tough decade coming up for El Paso. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to touch on because we're seeing so many young professionals go to other cities. Sometimes it's Austin, sometimes it's Dallas, some bigger cities here. Bob, what can El Paso do to try to retain some of those young professionals? Again, we did mention it's not just college grads because that could be deceiving here, but it's also highly skilled people of all ages that are leaving. But it does, uh, the trend does look like it is a lot of young people that are looking uh, for opportunities elsewhere. What, what does that tell us? I think the first answer to that question is we should talk to some of the people who've been leaving and get an understanding of the reasons why. Uh, uh, people choose where to live for a variety of reasons. Joe mentioned the weather here, which is a you know fantastic draw, and, and that'll help for a lot of people. But I, I think it, it always is going to come back to money. And, and, you know, can I make enough to support myself and my family? Um, uh, and if not, where do I need to go? So I think we really need to begin to address uh, the wage issue. And as Joe said, it, it's not an easy nut to crack um, because El Paso is largely run on small businesses. And, you know, it's not like they have this influx of cash. So how do we make these, these trade-offs uh, to keep El Paso at attractive? Uh, uh, and, you know, we need to talk about the amenities that are here that help uh, uh, keep people comfortable. Um, uh, you know, we've got another good thing going for us with the comparatively low crime rate. Can we maintain that? Uh, so there's lots of things we can address, but I think the wage structure has to be the first point we really dive into.
And Joe, how should our local leaders be reacting to this very important information that we're getting from the census here? Should they be alarmed and what should they be doing? JC, they should. We should almost consider this a crisis and go back to what was done a couple decades ago and look at the major employers in our city as at least a central point. Texas Tech, uh, UTEP, Fort Bliss. Uh, people forget how close we were to almost losing Fort Bliss. What has been done lately to pump that up? Um, and again, working with the largest uh, employers is a start. I like the idea of asking people why they're, they're, they're leaving. I think it's gonna be pretty simple answer. I think it's gonna be opportunity uh, and money. So it's not something that you can blame city government or county government or, or even the school districts, but I think all of them need to start talking collectively together. And it's just not happening lately. I just don't seem to see that. I mean, I hear about us going out to try to get one new business, but that's not it. We need to create a situation in El Paso where it makes sense to locate because of uh, the logistics of being on Interstate 10 between California and Florida having one of the largest military bases in North America being here, but what have we done for you lately type of a thing. Um, UTEP has been in the news because of all the the, the flights and the, the, the space stuff going on. Is that something to, to build on? I think there's plenty of things to have conversations about, but I think this should be like the number one issue for our leaders. Again, not just this coming year, but for the next decade. Lastly, Bob, is there any indication that this census was impacted by the pandemic with, future, with, with fewer people participating this year? Uh, there are, there's always going to be an undercount, and I guess the significant question is, you know, is it so much that it affects our political representation? And, and my best guess is this, this count was pretty thorough here. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that the final population count for the county came in above what the estimates were. I actually think the pandemic may have helped boost El Paso's numbers a little bit because some of those young families that had migrated out to areas like the Permian Basin came back uh, during the pandemic uh, because their jobs uh, went away and they needed to be back around family. So I think, if anything, the pandemic may have helped uh, boost our numbers a little bit and, and actually maybe masking some of these challenges that we're talking about. A lot to be seen here with this slow growth. I'd like to thank my guests for joining me here tonight. Thank you at home for joining us as well. I'm JC Navarrete. This has been ABC7 Extra. Good night.